study of the book of Philemon. So let's open up our Bibles to Philemon. <clears throat> it is the shortest of Paul's epistles, and yet it contains a very powerful message for the church of Jesus Christ. It is definitely a book that speaks to the spirit of the age and the world in which we live. Slavery is a topic that comes up. Forgiveness is addressed. Sacrificial love is emphasized. All of these things are emphasized in this short letter. <clears throat> we're going to uh, turn to the Lord in prayer right now and we're gonna seek the understanding that his spirit can supply whenever we study his word. And so if everybody's there, let's pray together. If you hear me <clears throat> scratching, itching my throat a little more, it's because it's very dry today for some reason. So I will try not to be too much of a stumbling block for you. But let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we welcome today a new journey, a short journey, but a powerful journey through one of the epistles that you inspired a man to send to another man, a short letter of correspondence that you inspired as your word to feed our souls. Father, I thank you. Every time we get to start a new book, it's like a new journey. And even though this is a short journey, Lord, we know, God, that there is something here for us. As Reggie mentioned earlier, Lord, wherever we are reading in our Bibles, Lord, you are faithful to speak to us in any given situation, at any given place in the word. Your word is alive. It's a living word that speaks to our heart. So Father in heaven, we just wanna pray for this time as we work our way verse by verse through this marvelous little epistle. We pray, Father God, that you would please speak to us. Lord, that you would help us on our journey right now by just bringing the truth out of this that we need for our lives. Lord, we know there's a historical context and we'll cover all of that. And we do wanna pray, Father God, that you would just help us to love your word. Father, that's my prayer for this flock, is that we would all be lovers of the word. Father, please put that passion in our hearts, God. When we look through Psalm 119 and we see what the psalmist said about his own love for your word, how your truth made his heart come alive, Lord, we want that to be us. So Father in heaven, please speak to us today. And Father, we commit this time to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. amen. <clears throat> you ready? All right. Well, as many of you know, whenever we begin a study in a new book, I like to do an introduction to that book. Uh, it's normally a good idea to set the stage, so to speak, and we will definitely see the value of doing so in this particular case because of the reason for writing this epistle. So let's go ahead and begin our time together by reading through the first three verses that will help us <clears throat> to set the stage for this. So let's go ahead and begin reading Philemon chapter one, <laughs> there's only one chapter, verse one. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So there we go, there's our 
our opening salutation. Well, as we can see, you know, when we do an introduction, we like to mention the author and the recipients and the date of the letter, the place of origin, the, the occasion, the purpose. These are all the things that we typically cover in an introduction. And it's pretty obvious to see here that the author of this epistle is the Apostle Paul. And we're going to come back to verse 1 and elaborate on the other details about Paul in just a moment. But Paul is the author of this letter. Timothy is mentioned alongside of Paul here, not because Timothy is the co-author, but because he was with Paul when Paul wrote this letter. <clears throat> and Paul here describes Timothy as our brother. And the reason that he describes him that way is because Philemon knew who Timothy was. So Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, two, the recipients are listed here. Number one, Philemon. Number two, Apphia. Number three, Archippus. And number four, the church that was meeting in the house of Philemon. And we'll go into more detail on that in just a moment. Now, as far as the date the place of origin, the occasion and purpose, we're just kind of, we're going to lump all of that together. This part of the background of this epistle is quite interesting. When we piece together the puzzle from the data of this epistle, along with a few other epistles, along with some historical data, we discover the following. <clears throat> First of all, this letter was written in about 62 AD during the Apostle Paul's first Roman imprisonment. Thus, Paul is in Rome having been imprisoned by Nero at the behest of Felix, the Roman governor Felix. With Paul in Rome are Tychicus, Timothy, and another guy who's gonna come up later on, Onesimus. Tychicus will soon be leaving Rome and traveling to Colossae to fill in for a gentleman by the name of Epaphras, who is or was the pastor of the church in Colossae. Accompanying Tychicus will be Onesimus. They would be delivering the Colossians epistle to that church. In addition to the letter to the church in Ephesus and the personal letter to Philemon. Philemon was a wealthy believer located in Colossae who had been converted through the apostle Paul. Onesimus, a name that's going to come up later, had been Philemon's slave. And apparently, for some unknown reason, Onesimus had helped himself to some of his master's possessions, Philemon, his master, to some of his possessions, and then fled to Rome. So he had stolen something, perhaps some money, and had left Philemon and fled to Rome. But somehow, someplace, he met the Apostle Paul. He ran, he ran into Paul. Paul led him to the Lord. Now the intimation is, is that for approximately a year or two, a certain period of time, Onesimus voluntarily functioned as Paul's servant while Paul was imprisoned. He served Paul, kind of became a companion of sorts to Paul. During this period, Onesimus was obviously daily exposed to the doctrinal expositions of Paul with the result that he soon attained, at least at some level, some spiritual, spiritual maturity, excuse me. <clears throat> 
Then one of two things apparently happened. Either Onesimus' conscience began to bother him and he confessed everything to Paul, what he had done to Philemon. Or number two, that perhaps Epaphras, who was a messenger from the Colossian church, Epaphras visited Paul and while visiting Paul, he recognized this runaway slave and he shared the incident with Paul. Whatever the cause, the situation needed to be rectified. As a runaway slave, for all practical purposes, Onesimus was a criminal. In running, in running away from Philemon, he had defrauded his master by depriving him of his services. Whether we agree with slavery or not, that was the case. He was an employee who had stolen something and had taken off. Paul knew that the relationship between Onesimus and Philemon needed to be restored. Onesimus had to return to his master and seek re forgiveness and restoration. Now here's an interesting little tidbit. One writer said this, to send Onesimus back alone would have exposed him to the danger of being caught by the ever vigilant slave catchers. The opportunity to send him back with someone came when Paul finished his letters to the Colossians and Ephesians. Because Tychicus would be delivering those letters, Onesimus could return to Colossae with him in relative safety. If returning Onesimus to his master was a sacrifice for Paul, it was a grave risk for Onesimus. <clears throat> By the way, there are some people that believe that the, this epistle to Philemon might have been the letter that was mentioned in Colossians when Paul said, I also sent a letter to Laodicea. You read that letter and have them read your letter. Some people believe this might be that letter. Maybe, maybe, that's speculation, but maybe. Anyway, so there obviously was some risk here. Onesimus, Onesimus didn't know exactly how Philemon was going to react. So this sort of sets things up. There you have the background. Now let's go back to verses one through three and let's cover any detail that we didn't look at yet. So that's the background. Now let's take a look at verse one again. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker. First of all, make note of the fact Paul is the author, as we already said, but notice that Paul describes himself here as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, he doesn't begin any of his other letters with that particular description. He does describe himself as a bond slave of the Lord, but here he describes himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul usually begins his letters by stressing his apostleship and thus emphasizing his authority. That is true even of the pastoral epistles. Even though they, like Philemon, were addressed to individuals, they dealt with issues relating to the church and so they carried a tone of authority. In this letter, however, Paul chooses not to use his authority but rather to appeal gently and singularly to a friend. It was for the sake of Christ and through the will of Christ that he was a prisoner. By mentioning his imprisonment, Paul makes a subtle appeal to Philemon and sets up the case that he's going to make later on. Philemon knew all that Paul had suffered for the cause of Christ and that knowledge was bound to have an effect on his willingness to do what Paul asked of him. So Paul says, <clears throat> describes himself prisoner of Christ Jesus and then mentions Timothy, our brother. Again, Timothy knew Philemon. Philemon knew Timothy. Timothy. 
Timothy had been with Paul in Ephesus where Philemon probably met him. The frequent mention of Timothy at the beginning of his letters identifies Timothy more closely with Paul in ministry. We all, we know that. We've talked about that numerous times, how close Paul and Timothy were. Paul knew that someday he would even pass the baton of spiritual leadership to him. He wanted Timothy to be recognized as a leader and as heir apparent. Also in verse one, Paul, in indicating who the letter was written to, Philemon, as noted in the introduction, Philemon, it says here, was, he refers to him as our beloved brother and fellow worker. Now, I already mentioned the fact that Philemon was a man of some means since he had at least one slave that we know of and a house in which a church met. In the major cities, at this time, most people lived in rooms rather than houses. And the fact that he had a room large enough for a meeting suggests that he had above average means. He was probably pretty well off. He is called here our beloved brother and fellow worker. Those terms probably recall the time when Paul and Philemon served together in Ephesus. And no doubt Philemon continued his service when he returned home to Asia Minor. These terms of endearment reveal the closeness between Paul and his dear friend and make Paul's request all the more remarkable. As we look into verse two, another person is mentioned here, another recipient of the letter, and to Aphia, our sister. Now, from the way that he addressed her, apparently she was well known to him also. Maybe she had at one time served with Philemon and Paul. Now, of course, she definitely served with Philemon because it is generally accepted that Aphia was probably Philemon's wife. The next person mentioned there in verse 2 is Archippus. Because of the family context, there are many that assume that he was the son of Philemon and Aphia. Paul called him a fellow soldier, applying a military metaphor to this Christian brother. He seldom referred to Christians at large by that designation. He referred to himself as that and did say that, you know, referred to Christians as a good soldier. But obviously Archippus was a man who was known as being a, someone who was with Paul in the trenches. Now the connection of Archippus to the city of Colossae and to the Colossian church is known because of one verse, and that's Colossians 4.17, which says this. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Special word just for him. I find it very interesting that you'll see that throughout Paul's epistles. He'll mention a name and he'll give a specific exhortation to that individual. Hey, you, make sure, make sure this individual does this or that individual does that. Very personal. And the last part of the greeting, who the letter is written to, and to the church in your house, Philemon's house. Now, in the major cities, social groups gathered in the homes of patrons who served as unofficial sponsors of that group. Urban Christians followed the same pattern hoping for a benefactor who had the resources to sponsor the church. 
Graciously, the Lord provided such people in most places, and Philemon was one of them. So fortunately, they were able to find a fellow believer who had no problem with the church assembling in their home. Now, I do want to make one side note about this. The early church, by and large, met in people's homes. The reason they met in people's homes is because that's where they could meet. There's nothing about meeting in a home versus some other type of building that is more sanctimonious. The house church movement, and it is a movement, the house church movement has sought to establish a link between the early church's habit of meeting in homes to the way that God intended for his church to meet today. The fact is, the Bible does not make a case about meeting in someone's home over meeting in some other facility. Whether it's an office building or a chapel or a funeral parlor, I know of a church that was meeting in a funeral parlor or a gas station, I knew of a church that was meeting in a gas station or on a beach. The body of Christ, or rather the church, is the body of Christ made up of people. And that assembly of believers are free to meet wherever they can. Wherever the church can assemble, wherever the people can assemble, that's the church, because the church is people. And it doesn't matter particularly where they meet, as long as they meet. Just meet somewhere. Actually, we're very blessed today to have buildings like this to meet in. So anyway, I know there's some folks that really believe the only way a church can be authentic is to get back to the first century roots of meeting in homes and it's just, yeah, well, okay, they did meet in homes but there was a reason that they did and that's because that's where they could meet. It's really, there's nothing deeper than that. Last part of the opening phrase or the opening section, salutation, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, Paul's characteristic greeting seems to embody the best that he could desire for those he loved. The word grace there includes all the undeserved favor which God showers on his people Peace is the result of that grace being poured out in someone's life. The spiritual serenity and poise which stabilize the lives of those who are taught by his grace. Both blessings come from, it says, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've already talked about this a few weeks ago, but that that phrase there is full of significance. It means that the Lord Jesus is equal with God the Father in bestowing grace and peace. And it would be blasphemy to give such honor to Christ if he were not truly and fully God. We've covered that in detail about three weeks ago. So there you have the opening salutation. Now let's go ahead and move into the main body of the letter. Verse four, let's go ahead and read verses four through six. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. Let's go ahead and stop there and back up to verse four. Now I can tell you that I am always enlightened and encouraged and convicted whenever I read words like this from the Apostle Paul. I'm enlightened because of the insight that I receive about Paul's habits and his spiritual discipline. Praying, making mention of these churches in his prayers. I'm convicted because of how challenged my heart is by his shepherd's heart and his love for the churches. 
I feel that at times my heart isn't nearly as weighed down by God's church as Paul's heart was. And I pray that God would give me more of a heart like Paul's. I'm also encouraged that Paul's heart was so given to the work of the Lord that his attitude was one of constant spiritual vigilance. Paul, in serving his Lord, was just dead set, pressing toward the mark in serving the Lord by serving God's church. That's an encouraging thing to see, a man so given to that. Now, <clears throat> In the course of praying for Philemon and the church in his home, it says in verse four that Paul became filled with gratitude. And he says in verse five, the reason for that is because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. <laughs> now some commentators suggest that Paul is using diplomacy in these opening verses, and that his pur purpose is to kind of soften Philemon's heart to receive Onesimus back again, to kind of butter him up. I think that ascribes an unworthy motive to the apostle and casts a shadow over the inspired text. The truth of the matter is, in several of Paul's letters, <clears throat> Those letters contain for praises for God's saints because of the great work of the Spirit in their lives. And Paul will do this even before he gives them correction in a, in a particular matter. Look at the church of Corinth. Paul opens up in 1 Corinthians praising the church in Corinth and then he, well, you guys know how much of a mess the church of Corinth was. He goes on to describe all of these problems in their midst. But... <clears throat> God's work in his church is to be acknowledged and to be given due praise even when there is spiritual progress to be made. I mean, I think we're a work in progress, aren't we? <laughs> Absolutely, we're a work in progress. But the report made it back to Paul of Philemon's faith toward the Lord and his saints. And so Paul here was appealing to a mature believer. We have every reason to believe that Philemon was a mature believer. And look at verse six again. <clears throat> he says, and I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good deed which is in you for Christ's sake. Now admittedly, verse six is a rather difficult verse to interpret. The Nasby has attempted to bring some clarification by adding the phrase, and I pray. It's italicized in the NASB, which means it's added in. And I pray, at the beginning of the verse here, in order to maintain its connection in thought with verse five, and that's fine, because it is. The word fellowship there is from that word that some of us probably have heard of, the word koinonia. And that word literally means close association involving mutual interests and sharing. Association, communion, that's typically how we think of the word translated, or fellowship, which is how it's translated here. In the context of our verse, that word, koinonia, fellowship, is to be understood actively. That is, of Philemon's sharing his resources with others in the spirit of liberality which springs from his faith in Jesus Christ. Thus, Paul's prayer is that, is that Philemon's liberality may become effective, he says there, and that he may experience the principle that's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 9 6, which says, he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Stop and think about that. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, right before that, it, also, it says, he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, right? <clears throat> 
you, you, you reap what you sow, in essence. What Philemon will reap, if the prayer is answered, is the knowledge and enjoyment of every blessing that Christians have in Christ, in the spirit of 2 Corinthians 9, 8, which says that God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. So he's making this appeal to Philemon. And Paul was, has one particular good deed in his mind for Philemon to perform. And the resources necessary for its performance are resources not of material affluence. It's not because Philemon happens to be a, a person who's well off. No, the performance is gonna be based on Christian grace in Philemon's heart, which he's already demonstrated. That's what he's making the appeal to here. Philemon the Christian, not Philemon the businessman. Not Philemon the slave owner. Philemon the man who's been touched by God and, who's, and the evidence of that is seen in what Philemon has been doing in serving the body of Christ and in initiating koinonia, okay? <clears throat> and then lastly, Let's go ahead and hit uh, verse seven and then we'll close out. He goes on to say to Philemon, for I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. So Philemon had a reputation for love. A fact that Paul says, that brought him much joy and comfort. I want to read to you this quote. One writer said that phrase, I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love, that phrase demands some of our attention. For Paul is in prison. He is chained. His physical movements are confined. His recreation is very limited. His pleasures are denied. In these circumstances, how can Paul make the statement that he's not just happy, but that he has much happiness, much joy and comfort? <laughs> well, <clears throat> end quote. Well, the answer to that's very simple because Paul had his mind on the right thing. Paul had his mind on the thing he was supposed to have his mind on. His heart was for the Lord and the ultimate glorification of the Lord. Through Philemon, the hearts of the saints had been refreshed, he says there. Now, <clears throat> the word hearts there actually translates a Greek word which literally means bowels. It refers to the seat of the feelings. People struggling, suffering, and hurting emotionally, these people had been refreshed by Philemon. Refreshed is a military term that speaks of an army resting from a march. Think about that. Philemon brought troubled people rest and renewal. He was a peacemaker. Philemon, as far as we know, was not an elder, he was not a deacon, nor was he even a teacher in the church. Most likely, he was a businessman. But he was a man of instinctive kindness. Apparently, he was a source of blessing to everyone. And that kind of person, Paul knew, could be counted on to forgive, to let something go if need be. How assuring it was to know that the hearts of the saints were being greatly refreshed by this beloved brother and especially by his love. No one lives to himself, no one dies to himself. Our affections affect, our action, excuse me, affect others. Our, action affect, our actions in our lives affect other people. 
and we cannot always measure the range of our influence. We have the limitless potential for good or for evil. And so here Paul is appealing to this man, having heard all the good things about Philemon. And so the stage is now set for the request that Paul is about to make of Philemon. And we will stop right there. And Lord willing, um, my goal is to actually finish this epistle up next week. Alrighty? So there you have it. Situation before us. What's going to happen next? Well, if you've read the letter, you already know. <clears throat> Let's stand. One of the things we're about to discover is how our relationship to the Lord and how that is lived out in our lives is to trump every other aspect of a relationship. For example, we may have a, we may feel like we have a right to do someone wrong when they have wronged us if we feel like we have a right to do them wrong because they've wronged us. And then the thought of the fruits of the Spirit come into mind. And we realize, no, what is to govern my reaction is what I know the Bible tells me I'm to do. That, that's just the way it's to happen in every relationship. Husbands relating to their wives, wives relating to their husbands. What rules that relationship? What should rule that relationship is what the scripture says should be the attitude of husbands and wives toward each other or parents to their children. What should rule that relationship? What the Bible says parents should do for their children and to their children and vice versa. Employee, employer. How should they re react to one another? If it's, in a Christian, if it's a Christian employer, then the Christian employer should <clears throat> show forth the fruits of the Spirit and how he treats his employees. And a Christian employee should do the same toward, to his employer whether they're Christian or not. We, we know that, right? These interpersonal relationships, we're, we're always being confronted with, the, with what is actually inside of our hearts every time we're interacting with people. That's how we find out what we're really made of. We also, also find out when we interact with people whether or not we know how to live out the Christian faith. Sometimes our knowledge base is limited and we don't know how to react the right way because we don't, we, don't, we don't know what the Bible says about a particular thing. We could walk in years in ignorance because we don't. Reggie mentioned earlier about you know, just having that passion of giving ourselves to the reading of Scripture so we can know what the will of God is, so that we know how God wants us to live. But don't take lightly those interpersonal relationships you know, when I hear my, my children playing a, a board game and I hear them bickering, sometimes we just think it's okay to do that. It's not. Uh, the scriptures are supposed to govern our, our attitude, our disposition, how we interact with people all the time. Remember that. We're gonna, and, and Philemon's gonna be asked to do something pretty heavy duty in just a moment. And, and if the scriptures govern his life, he, he's, gonna, he's gonna say amen, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I should do this, because God would have me do that. Father in heaven, we do pray, Lord, that you would please help us to consider our ways to consider our heart response
toward the people we interact with every day. Father, please conform us to the image of Jesus. Please transform our lives. Please renew our minds. Please help us to walk in the spirit that we would not obey the lust of our flesh. Father, we thank you for these opening words and we thank you for this introduction and we pray, Father, that you would speak to us, Lord, as we endeavor to work through the rest of this letter. Until that time, Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Lord willing, see you next week. We have raised a thousand voices.